This video is about what's inside one of those EcoFlow battery powered power stations. Let's pop this box open and see what's inside. Now looking around things, this is clearly a circuit board behind here that connects to the battery pack. And the only thing that connects this to the rest of the unit is these two wires plus some kind of signaling wire. So I figure if I disconnect all of those, I should be safe with the rest of this gadget. And I'll disconnect the red one. I'll put this cover back on just so I won't accidentally short something down here. The thing with these lithium battery packs is they contain so much energy, if you short a fully charged one, it will catch fire. I drained this one down a fair bit, but just to be safe. Oh, look at all this stuff. That's the power electronics in here, all right. Now, I'm getting less and less sure of what's going on in here, but uh, these 450 volt capacitors, those are no doubt the input for the H-bridge, because you need a substantial voltage for that H-bridge. Um, these two, I'm guessing, are output filters. This could be the inductor for the boost converter, which would make this area here the power supply for taking the 120 volt and charging up the battery. Now there are two relays here, this one and this one. And this big plug that goes to the AC output. So why do I want to modify this thing? Well, I broke the inverter on it and that way I can't use the charge off of AC anymore and I figure if I make a slight change to it, I might still be able to charge it. More on how I broke it later. So I have to deactivate one of these two relays. I think I'm starting to get to the bottom of this. So this side here is the switching power supply. This is the big, big, big inductor thingy down here, this orange guy. Or actually, that is a transformer. That would be the primary winding. This is the secondary winding. So this would uh, have the uh, battery voltage on it, and this goes up to, to the 450 volt capacitors, which are up here. These transistors here are active rectification which is more efficient than using diodes. And then this row of four transistors, the terminals here, that's the inverter. The inverter outputs are here and here. And those, through inductors, like I'd drawn in my speculative circuit, connect to this relay, and these two terminals connect to the AC input. So this is the relay that passes through external AC to the output. So I just have to deactivate this relay. And the other relay seems to be just something for cutting the inverter off from the output. Maybe for overload protection or something. But anyways, I need to make sure this relay doesn't activate. So I just have to cut this trace here, which is for the coil of the relay. If I cut that, that relay will never close. So I'm going to try to use a hacksaw blade to cut that trace. Fortunately, there's nothing else nearby. After that, I probed around to make sure the trace was indeed cut, which is a bit tricky because the whole circuit board is epoxy coated. So making sure I get a good probing contact was tricky. So that last segment was recorded on a Friday. And while dealing with the kids, I kept thinking about this thing and I realized I missed something. I had realized the uh, battery power comes through these big terminals. The capacitors are in parallel to those to steady the current a bit. These uh, two sets of four transistors, or the inverter, goes through this transformer and then this inductor. And then these four transistors are active rectification to charge up these 450 volt capacitors. And then these four transistors on this heat sink are the inverter. There's a choke on the inverter to steady the current and this capacitor steadies it. And these are probably just for filtering for radio interference and goes out to here. That's all nice and good. But where is the charging circuit? This thing can charge at 1800 watts. And then it dawned on me, this thing doesn't have a separate charging circuit. It just runs the inverter backwards to take the line AC and feed that back into the battery at 1800 watts. Very clever. And I mentioned earlier, they use uh, these transistors to be an active rectifier after this transformer and this inverter, which is more efficient. But the clever part about that is these transistors can also act as an inverter and these transistors then become the active rectification. So the whole thing just runs backwards. This is analogous to an electric car using the motor as a generator and the inverter to feed power back into the battery to do regenerative braking. They just do the same thing, just without a motor. 
So the schematic for the power electronics is something like this. We've got the 54 volt battery and then we have these transistors to invert. I just drew them as black squares and these are doubled up because potentially you have 100 amperes coming out of here. Step up transformers, active rectification, take it to somewhere in the range of 160 volts to 450 volts DC. I'm not sure what voltage. This is the big bank of capacitors and then we have the inverter and then that goes out to the socket and also goes out to the plug. This is the relay that I deactivated and that really needs to be there because if we're running this inverter to generate power here, we don't want to send power out the plug because we could either electrocute somebody or try to activate the uh, grid if it's still plugged into that. Me having disconnected this relay means of course we're not able to send power in here through the charging circuit and that charging circuit is busted because at least two of these transistors is now burnt out. So. The inverter is busted and that means I can't use it the other direction either to charge it up. Which means 120 volt inverter and 120 volt charger just doesn't work anymore. So the only thing that's still usable is the uh, DC charging and discharging. And that circuitry is much less beefy because that's limited to maybe 200 watts. Whereas this thing can peak over 4000 watts. So my whole modification with that relay turned out to be rather futile. And there is the possibility that only two of these transistors here are burnt out and replacing that would fix it. But uh, I can't find that transistor to buy anywhere. So I can't really do anything about that. And it would be very difficult to do anything about that too because this board is actually coated with epoxy. So that would get really smelly trying to solder a new transistor in there. Plus, getting these transistors out would be very, very difficult because they're stuck in behind everything. And what follows is my explanation of how I broke it, which I actually filmed first, trying to not look like a dumbass for breaking it. This all started because my kilowatt meter stopped working. I realized it stopped working when it was plugged into the EcoFlow and I tested the circular saw starting. And after that, this didn't work anymore. So I suspected it had something to do with the waveforms coming out of the EcoFlow while the circular saw starts up. So I plugged an extra power cord into the back of the EcoFlow, hooked it up to my trusty old analog scope, and with the circular saw plugged in, started out a few times and watched the waveforms. And what I saw coming out of the EcoFlow was a beautiful sine wave, but for a very brief instant while the circular saw started up, there was on top of that a uh, very high frequency AC waveform on top of the sine wave. Only lasted maybe a few milliseconds though. And reverse engineering the power supply part of the kilowatt meter, that is indeed vulnerable to that sort of waveform. Now I'd love to show you this waveform on the scope, but uh, right after that I broke the EcoFlow. Because I wasn't entirely sure whether those high frequency oscillations were because of the EcoFlow box or because of the circular saw. So to run this experiment off of line, I figured the easiest way to do that would be to plug the power cord into the EcoFlow box and then plug that into the power bar. And the instant I plugged that into the power bar, the lights in the shop went out, the breaker had popped. And after that I realized that even unplugged, the inverter on the EcoFlow box no longer worked. What went wrong here? I was aware that the uh, ground of the scope is actually tied to the ground that it's plugged into. But uh, when I scope this out, it's like, no problem, this box is floating. It's not attached to ground anywhere, so I don't have to worry about the scope being grounded. But when I plugged its main power cord into here, this box also became grounded. Now, I had been careful to hook up the uh, ground clip of the scope to a neutral, not hot. Because in most electrical system, neutral is pretty much at ground level, but not in this box. Now if I was designing the inverter for this box, I would have my 52 volt battery pack, a boost converter to take that up to 160 volts, because you need that to generate 120 volts RMS, followed by an H bridge and a bit of filtering, connect that to the socket, and of course you tie the internal ground to the ground on the socket. Simple enough, right? The problem with that design is neutral is not ground, and neutral must not be tied to ground. And I imagine the EcoFlow's inverter is similar to this, certainly with what's left of it uh, probing the uh, neutral and ground pins, neither of those is at ground level. It still runs a little bit, producing about 7 volts and then shuts off immediately. So I'm guessing something is burnt out with the inverter. And I suspect this box, when it switches over to direct line power, 
the inverter just gets deactivated but not disconnected. So this uh, burnt out uh, inverter output stage, I assume, now shorts out when this tries to connect the line power out to the sockets here because the inverter is still on there and shorts it. Now this box is still perfectly capable of providing 12 volt power and being charged through here, 12 volts or any sort of DC voltage. So it's still usable to some extent. And this mishap could have been avoided if instead of using this scope, I had used my USB scope that hooks up to a laptop computer because the laptop isn't grounded and neither is this thing. And it is especially not grounded if I run the laptop computer off of battery. What, you're still here? You must also watch EEV blog videos, right? So should you get one of those battery packs? Well, it depends. If your goal is to have some kind of backup for when the power fails every two years, a Texas type situation, it's not the right solution because one of these battery packs, if neglected for two years, will self-discharge beyond the safe level and then the battery pack will be toast, just like an electric car. But a gas generator for that sort of application is good because neglected for two years, you can still start it as long as you're good with fiddling with gas engines. But if you want something that you use frequently, is quiet and you can use indoors, this is actually a really good solution. The other thing that it's great for is if you want some kind of off-grid power solution for a cabin or a trailer. Uh, because to do that you need your solar panels, you need a peak power point tracker, you need a charge controller, you need a battery pack, and you need an inverter, and you need all those to work together. And you need some kind of uh, power management system on all that. A lot of pieces to get to work. Whereas if you buy one of these EcoFlow boxes, it's got all that stuff already integrated into one box. All you have to do is plug solar panels into it and turn it on and plug it in and use your appliances. Simple as that. And don't forget, there is a sale on right now. 